Campbell now bowls the pipe to Cleary. Smashes it through mid-wicket for ball. Darlington bowls now to cut shot. Oh, it's a good one too. Beautifully played away there by Cleary. Cleary once more. And she's bowled her, and that's it. West Australia, they've won. They've captured their first WNCL title. A very warm welcome to the Cricket Library Weekly. My name is Matt Ellis, and joining me as always is Robbie McKinlay. A very warm welcome to you. Good afternoon, Matt. It is afternoon here in Eastern Australia, and well, it's all over, Matty. Um, the Test Series, we're still talking about it. Some are talking about it in negative terms. I would want to speak about it in a positive term because I think Test Cricket, yes, is alive and well. What a fantastic series and well done, India. Um, the best team won the series. 2-1 India. Uh, what a brilliant game at the Gabba, Matty. I, yeah, Australia got beat, but bravo, India. They certainly uh, they played with... Um, a lot of style, a lot of conviction. They did it the hard way, and they got the points. Absolutely, they did. And we'll be talking about the the Test Series. We'll sort of wrap that up uh, to open up the program. But big news, Robbie, for our fans of the WNCL, particularly Western Australian cricket fans. We've got a pretty big audience over there. Uh, Piper Cleary joining us uh, for a chat. So looking forward to that. And also a bit later on, we're going to have a look at the run home for the teams in the BBL. But let's kick things off with this test series. Robbie, you you articulated it really well there, the better team winning. And I I was watching it at home. I'd got home from work, uh, had the television on, uh, my nine-year-old sitting on the lounge as well. And I think it was down to about six runs to win at the time. And I said, yeah. I said to my son, I said, this is going to be one of the most historic moments in Test cricket, and you're watching it yeah. right now. And just at that moment, um, the television reception dropped out. Oh, it did. <laughs> it did. Oh, and so, no way. so, so, so we're there, and. I've just oh. made this bold statement. We're on the edge of our seats. I was actually preparing dinner whilst oh. while, whilst on the edge of my seat. Dropped everything. Mad <laughs> scramble to get uh, the, the cords plugged into the right spot to get oh. things happening again. And fortunately, we did get to see the epic Phoenix, but it was just one of those classic uh, scenarios where you're like, oh, dear, we're going to miss this here. Something big is going to happen and we're going to miss it. But we didn't. Uh, well done, India. Ravi Shastri uh, set a magnificent tone in that group as the coach. I can't underestimate the work that he's been doing off the field with that team. And their on-field performance, notwithstanding a period of play in that Adelaide Test match, India have been absolutely top shelf. And hats off to them for producing outstanding cricket throughout the series. Yeah, absolutely, Matty. And look, I, I, I thought the Australians tried their heart out. There's no doubt about it, but they just came up against a better opponent. And you know what? This happens in life, Matt, in all, yeah. all levels of, of sport, in everywhere. You go to school, in the, in the classroom at school. And um, yeah, I, I must admit I'm a, um, a little bit taken back by some of the negativity points oh. around the Australian side, and particularly Tim Payne. Please, Tim Payne has played a massive part in resurrecting the Australian cricket with his with his leadership, and leadership encompasses everything. Yeah. Yes, it's nice to win test matches and that, but it means a little bit more than that. Um, and when he did have that minor hiccup the week before, he was the first one to put his hand up and come up and um, and you know say I got it wrong. But yeah, I just it, to chase over three around about three hundred and twenty in the last day in Brisbane, where we hadn't been beaten for something like thirty three years. Um, you've just got to give credit to the winner there. And, um, yeah, but credit to both sides for, for producing the test series that they did. It takes two to tango. Yeah. And as they say in the classics, there's always got to be a winner. And on this occasion, I think the best side won the series. And that was confirmed with the 2-1 result. Yeah, absolutely, Robbie. And interesting, um, there wasn't real sheer domination in terms of runs scored. Only three centuries scored throughout the series. Yeah. Uh, and there wasn't a bowler that 
sort of rip through attacks uh, on regular intervals. There was just the three five-wicket hauls. Two of those was Josh Hazelwood. He was a- absolutely outstanding with the ball. And then Siraj as well taking that five-wicket haul. They're the only three five-wicket hauls in the series. So it wasn't like it was a, a one-man band. It was a real team yeah. effort uh, for, for both teams. And just on Tim Payne as well, averaging 40.8 with the bat, if you don't mind, yeah. for the series. Yep. Uh, a no, couple of enough. crucial half centuries in there as well. Yes, that's right. Without Tim Payne, we you know we may well have lost three nil. So, um, but yeah, look, and a couple of, there was a tough uh, stumping chance off uh, Rishan Pant there in the last day, but because the ball spat and kicked and it was so high, I think he would have got back anyway before the ball bales were able to be whipped off. But um, yeah, oh, it was fascinating stuff, Matty, and it was um, it was just brilliant cricket. Absolutely, Robbie. Now, uh, you follow the ICC Test Championship rankings a lot more closely than I do. Uh, mm. what, what does this mean now for Australia and our chances of, of, of taking that World Test Championship? Yeah, so it actually has had a huge impact on what's happened. So India now have gone on top of the table. So Australia and South Africa, from what I can make out, one of the last teams that are scheduled to play test cricket before the it, it all shuts down, before the final scheduled for, I think it's Lords in June. Now, at the moment, Australia has dropped down to third. India are on 71.7%. Okay. New Zealand are on 70%. And Australia are on 69.2%. England on 652 behind us. Now, for Australia to qualify for the championship final, when they go to South Africa... They cannot afford to lose a test, and they will need to lose to win two of them. And if that one could be drawn, if Australia wins three nil, they will they will get there. If they win two nil in the three test series, they'll qualify for the championship final. So as you can see, Maddie, it's now there is pressure on every single test match. Wow. Even if Australia win the first, if Australia win the first two test matches, um, that, that third test match, even though the series has been decided in South Africa, the championship finalists have not been so it is quite fascinating what it's done that that result it was an interesting one that i was when i was on a stump on day four i'm thinking yeah it, a, a draw's not good enough for australia in this series because yeah. india would have still retained the, the gavaska border trophy but in the back of my mind i'm thinking mm, a draw is not a bad result as far as our world test championship goes so yeah, and so that's you, going to be very interesting. Are you the, the, the kind of guy that's uh, got your notebook out there, Robbie, crunching crunching the numbers mm. as you go? I, I thought I was. Yeah, yeah. I, had no. a, I had a feeling that might be <laughs> that might be the case. I I think we love we love our notebooks, you and I, and um, you're certainly well across uh, the ICC Test Championship. Now, Robbie, we're going to throw to a chat I had with Piper Cleary, and after that. This will give you a bit of prep time. I'm just throwing this on you now. We're going to have a look. (laughs) We're going to have a have a look at the run home uh, for the big bash. Uh, Some very very interesting scenarios coming up in the big bash to find that top five. And Mm -hmm. we think we we think we've got the sixes locked in at this stage, but there's a whole plethora of different scenarios that might raise their head. But first. Let's have a listen to where things are up to for Western Australia and their WNCL campaign and learn a little bit more about Piper Cleary, who's been on the Australian first class scene for a number of years now and making her mark with the Perth Scorchers and the Western Fury. Here's Piper Cleary now on the Cricket Library Weekly. It's a very warm welcome to the Cricket Library Weekly. Piper Cleary, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. It's getting to the time of year where we're nearly there as far as Women's National Cricket League's concerned, uh, WA the defending champions. Uh, But before we get to WNCL, I'd, I'd really love to know, Piper, where your passion for the game started. Um, yeah, obviously, I suppose like loads of loads of young kids, um, you generally grow up playing cricket in the backyard. So, um, yeah, I lived in a small mining town up north, and um, I've got a twin brother. 
um, yeah, we basically watched cricket, breathed cricket, you know, absolutely loved it. So, um, yeah, we used to always play out the back and then um, kind of just the general go and start playing club cricket and then um, just carry on from, from there. I think when you're kind of all right for me at a young age, it probably um, like leads you to hang on to it a little bit more. And, um, yeah, I, I absolutely love it. I love watching cricket. I love playing it. So, um, yeah, I, I'm just a big fan of, of it all together, really. You mentioned uh, playing with your brother, a twin brother, um, in a small town. Was club cricket easily accessible for you back then growing up? Um, yeah, it was purely because obviously there was like footy cricket. Uh, what else? You have table and kind of obviously I'll kind of run over different times. Um, so it was only small. Obviously there wasn't loads of clubs like we've got down here in Perth, but um we kind of had two teams every week and, um, yeah, it, it was really good. A lot of effort um, and a lot of people's time um, put into it. So, no, it was, it was really good. And, and were you playing on a team with your brother, with, with boys or a mixed team, girls team? Yeah, no, so it was purely a, a boys, boys team. Um, I was the only girl and, yeah, kind of the team just changed up every week because we were all kind of a core group of players anyway. Um, so, yeah, it was... Um, I suppose I didn't really know any different, to be honest, where now you see loads of um, girls' club teams out there. Um, very rarely do you see kind of just one girl uh, in a group of boys. So, yeah, it was a little bit different how I um, did it, but most of the girls kind of around my age um, had a similar experience, to be honest. And, and you play indoor cricket as well. When when did you start playing indoor cricket? Yeah, I, I played indoor for... Oh, yeah, I can remember kind of on and off. Um, yeah. And then I went away on a couple of trips um, with that. That was like, I don't play anymore, but um, it, it was so much fun. Like, it was just, just particularly because it ran through winter. So um, it was quite competitive as well. Obviously, it's quite short. So um, being a bit younger, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it's a shame I probably don't play anymore. Yeah, and uh, you played a bit of representative indoor cricket as well um when when did you kind of realize that you were going to be good enough to take your game to the next level move on from club cricket and uh, when did you start getting noticed um i i mean it's hard, yeah it's hard to say like i probably never thought oh yeah you know i'm i'm better than this i, I probably i still don't really think that i think you just um yeah, so obviously, like, through under 15, through to under 18, I probably started getting, you know, invited down to training, um, looked at a bit more, started probably doing a bit where, um, better in the, like, A and B grade stuff we've got down here. So, yeah, um, yeah it was probably just a progression through that. And I suppose I was lucky in the under 18 team, um, there was, like, at least half of us that probably went on and, and continued on after it. So there was there was a pretty good group of us that kind of stuck together and, and grew up playing under 15s, under 18s, 19s, into the state stuff. Um, so, yeah, it, it kind of just happened like that. But I was really just fortunate that there was a lot of decent young girls when, when I started. Yeah. So it kind of didn't really feel like any different. Yeah, yeah. And did you did your family move to Perth, or when when did you when did you make the move uh, to the city? Yeah, we moved um, when so me and my brother finished our primary school up there, and then so for high school we came down and we went to um, Kent Street Senior High School, which has a cricket program. Okay. Um, so and again was the only girl to kind of go through and do that um, for yeah my five years of, of high schooling and. Um, that was awesome. Like I still have a really good relationship with the school now. Um, so I've met a re- like a lot of really good people and the, the guys in that program were, um, were awesome. I'm still really close with a couple of them now. So, um, yeah, I think that was really lucky that my parents, yeah, w- wanted to move us down, not purely for cricket, mainly for the schooling. Um, but yeah. obviously the cricket was a, was a bonus, just way more opportunities. And your reflections on breaking into that WA squad, was that something you'd envisaged or did that, take you by surprise a little bit, getting getting the chance to, to move into the, the Western Fury squad? Yeah, it definitely took me by surprise. I think I was so I was probably so young when it happened. Like I didn't really um, 
you know, perhaps didn't realise how much of a big deal it was or, um, you know, not quite grateful for the opportunities you probably had when you're 16, 17, 18. So um, it kind of all happened really quickly as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it was different. And then I suppose just obviously being in there so young, it was just like probably not putting too much um, expectation on myself, just kind of letting it happen. It doesn't need it all happen so quickly, which obviously when you're young, you don't really um, – yeah, you, you don't know these things until you get a bit older. <laughs> You've been around for a, bit, a little while. Yeah, and, and you get a bit of a taste of um, the elite level pathway stuff as well um, with the Shooting Stars program and the National Performance Squad. What was that like having you uh, get, getting put into that next kind of level environment after making a bit of an impression at WA? Uh, yeah, those trips were awesome I think yeah I went to Sri Lanka and India a few times um and Dubai even as well so like I went to some amazing places um and again like similar sort similar group of girls that kind of stayed on for three four years together um it was a, a really great experience it's funny like obviously going into a program like that I was probably one of the um, you know the ones at the back, like one of, one of the worst players in comparison to the rest. So it was um, it was really interesting going to those things and really having to, I suppose, work hard and and really try learn off the other people around you because yeah, they, they were much better. So um, that was really good learning um, learning tools really. And even like the yeah the NPS camp we had, um, well, it was a couple of years ago now, but um, that was over like a three month period um, in the pre season, and that was. Yeah, probably one of the best pre seasons I've had. Um, just learning off everyone else, the coaches we had to so, um, Yeah, it's a really, really good thing to, to be a part of. Yeah, yeah. And then taking that experience back to Western Australia, did you find, like you just mentioned, it was one of the best pre seasons you had? Did you find that you were able to then take your game to another level going back to WA from there? Yeah, I think as well, like just obviously put you, you go on a different setup and you probably push yourself a little bit more as well. So it's um, probably a bit of, um, you know, perspective as well, I suppose, that coming back in, probably work a little bit harder here as well. You, you kind of get used to things. Um, so it's probably just, yeah, a bit of a wake-up call as well. But yeah, we could, there was a couple of us that went over, so um, we could bring a lot back with us as well. And um, it, was, it was quite nice coming back into the environment you knew and, you're really close with everyone. So, um, yeah, both, both really, really good. Yeah, yeah. Now, WNCL coming up, uh, it's been a very disjointed uh, start to the season. Things have changed with the draw and things already. But I, I just want to go back to last season. It was February last year, WA get to lift the WNCL title, the Ruth Preddy Trophy uh, for the uh, just a really uh, – Massive achievement for WA to win that in Sydney against New South Wales, who've been very dominant in the competition over so many years. What does something like that mean to you uh, as someone who's been around the squad for quite a while? Oh yeah, it was um, yeah, it, it was amazing. We still we still talk about it now. It's almost <laughs> coming up to a year past it. Um, yeah. It was just for our group. Like it was it was awesome. Um, obviously, it's been a very long time since. WA, um, we won anything in, in the women's space. So, um, you know, I think it just gave everyone a little bit of a taste at what we can actually achieve. And um, that game was awesome because it was, like, it wasn't just one person that won us that game. It was actually a load of individual performances that kind of um, built up over the game and with the bat and the ball. So it was a really hard fought win. And that, our whole season was kind of like that. So, um, yeah, it was really special. And obviously, yeah, with this season, it's been a bit, all over the shop at the moment, but I think we're yeah, about a month and we're meant to be playing again. So fingers crossed, um, yeah, we can kind of take what, what last season um, had for us. And, you know, it was just really good fun. Like, there's nothing better than winning, is there? So, um, <laughs> yeah, I hope we can we can do it again and, and many more times. And, and just from a personal point of view, you make 20 in that game. Um, so you make some valuable runs at the back end of the innings. And then the emotion of being the bowler who takes the final wicket. Just sheer jubilation there. From a personal point of view, uh, being able to contribute to a win like that, uh, 
does that make it even extra special or is it just just being a part of the team? Yeah, well, I think, yeah, it obviously is a little bit special because we were, when I went in, we were probably, yeah, 40, 50 runs thinking, oh, um, we might be in trouble if we don't get this. So, yeah, the partnership I had with um, Amy at the end, um, it was really nice to kind of go in and contribute a little bit like that and just we probably put ourselves in a little bit, you know, anything over 200 is going to be a, a good chase. So, um, yeah, it was really good fun. And, yeah, bowling the last over, I mean, they needed, they needed 20 or something off the last. 15, whatever it was, which um, yeah, I don't think they were ever going to get. So it was actually quite nice to bowl that. Just <laughs> in, enjoy the moment. Like we, yeah. It was nice to get the wicket as well. It would have been a bit sad if we couldn't get the wicket. But um, everyone was just really enjoying that part the last couple of overs and we kind of yeah, knew we snapped home. And, um, it was a really nice feeling. Yeah, I hope we can do it again. Yeah, and the group has the group been um, able to, train the same way you have in the past or has COVID kind of rocked your preparations this season at all? Um, no, we haven't really been affected um, in terms of training, like a little bit like very early on. Um, yep. But no, we've had all group sessions, um, everyone together. It's it's just been, yeah, the only difference I suppose we've been training for a very long time now without any games. So that's been, yeah, it's, it's like finding the balance, isn't it? Um, yep. you know, when you train for almost six months now or seven months without any games. It's kind of like, um, yeah, not overdoing it, but then still kicking along. Um, so when we do come up with our games, we're um, we're ready to go. So, but yeah, all in all, it's been pretty similar, just life of games so far. Yeah, and I'm just really interested to know how you, you manage life and cricket. We've, we've had uh, a number of uh, female players on the podcast in the past and there's varying um, levels of uh, outside activities that they do. Like some of them are, are working and playing cricket still and some are, some are able to play cricket without needing to work so much. W- what takes up your time outside of cricket and how do you find the balance to try and uh, do things well? Yeah, um, I obviously am a uh, curator as well, away from cricket. So yep. I actually work at a school um, and the club ground. So, um, yeah, to be honest, it can it can be a bit hectic, but I'm, I suppose I'm lucky that generally we will start training at 11 or 12. Um, so I can normally get to work before, do yep. a little bit, go back after. So I can kind of split it up like that. Um yeah, there are some days when it gets tricky, but I just try and I try and balance it so that when we have either no training or it's a shorter session, um, I'll get in and do most of the work that I need to do on those days. Um, otherwise, I've had days where I've tried to do it all in one day, and it's just I get home and I'm absolutely buggered. So, yeah. um, but I like I love doing curating as well. So I'm like I don't want to give either one up. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just balancing it. And then I just make sure, like, on a Saturday Arvo or Sunday Arvo after career, I just can have some some chill time and just kind of do nothing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've got we've got a couple of girls that are, like, um, that do work. And then we've got some that don't and, you know, 100% cricket. So it is um, – it's a tricky little, like, phase at the moment. Yeah. Um, but I think for me, like, if I purely just did cricket, I think I'd go a little bit nuts. So I like to do something away from it as well to keep myself busy. Um, but, yeah, it's just – it's like anything, isn't it? It's just balancing it. Yeah, and um, you enjoy your fishing? Yeah, I love my fishing. So, unfortunately, the cricket season on the weekends kind of ruins that. But um, <laughs> come <laughs> April, May, um, I can get up there a little bit more. But, yeah, I, I love it. Like, my parents have a house couple hours from Perth um, but we've got the boats and stuff up there and um, yeah we always try to get up there as much as we can and go fishing and um, yeah I, I love it it's a really nice thing to do with my dad yeah absolutely that quality time that, that that sounds awesome good way to do that on a fishing boat and seeing you catch catch some big ones by the looks of your Instagram profile yeah we we generally don't do too badly we normally like that one on um the most recent one on my Instagram. We were literally about to come back in. I was like, I actually have got a little bit seasick from been out there in a while. And I'm like, oh, like, come on, Dad, we'll last, last one and we'll go. And then, so literally the last five minutes of full London. So generally, we've got a bit of work. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, that's good stuff. And just finally, we've been talking about cricket bats on the podcast recently, and I thought it'd be a good chance for you to tell us about the cricket bat you use. You're you're aligned with Kingsbury Cricket. Um, what do you, what do you like about the Kingsbury cricket bats, and can we expect to see more runs flowing from you this summer? <laughs> well, I hope so. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm with I'm with Kingsbury this season, and um, yeah, they're just they're really good bats. Um, they're only kind of new on the scene over here in Perth, um, and basically, yeah, I just wanted to try something new, and um, like the guys really awesome. Um, yeah, help me out with whatever I need. And, yeah, I'm, I'm batting up the order for club cricket, so I was thinking, oh, I'd better get a good bat and uh, yeah. see how we go. And, and what weight What weight bat do you use? Uh, so I'm using a 2.8. Wow. I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, so I had a 2.6, um, yeah. but I probably like a, something a little bit heavier, so I've gone for a 2.8. Um, so, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Ah, very good. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you, Piper. Uh, thanks so much for giving us your time for the Cricket Library Weekly. Uh, wish you all the best with WA for the WNCL season. Hope that gets underway well and um, hope the wickets you're producing for the, the people playing on them uh, get some good games of cricket. They look like pretty good wickets from what I've seen, so keep up the good work there. Oh, thank you very much for that. Cheers for having me. Hey, this is Piper Cleary, and you're listening to the Cricket Library Weekly. And what a fine young person she is, Piper Cleary. Great to hear she is ready and raring to go for the WNCL season and still involved doing some coaching down at the Kent Street High School with the girls there, putting back into the juniors and... That Kingsbury cricket bat, Robbie. I can see her wielding that around this summer and, and peeling off some runs. So all the best to Piper there. And, and we're very appreciative of her giving her time. A massive thanks for Piper Cleary, Cleary joining us on the podcast this week. Now, Robbie, speaking of cricket bats, we were talking about the best bats of the, the Big Bash. Yep. I, I'm hearing on the... Um, through through the country grapevine, you you might have had a hit on the weekend. Can you tell us? Can you tell us how you went because you actually have a cricket library sticker on the back of your bat, yeah. like like the pros do. Um, yep. Sponsored. Are you actually are you sponsored or are you just are you just putting that sticker on there, giving well, the perception that the cricket library have some sort of interest in oh, your yeah. batting? I would like to put a bit of mayo on it. But, um, <laughs> I, I am sponsored by the Cricket Library Weekly, mainly because you sent me one in the mail. <laughs> so I stuck it on my TNF bat. And, um, yes, Matt, I'm happy to say that um, it's certainly reaped the benefits. Mine might have disappeared over the uh, mid-wicket boundary on the weekend. Oh, just right in your wheelhouse, you might say. Yes. Don't bowl there to R.B. McKinley. No. <laughs> so there you go. But I would encourage anyone out there, if you, hey, if you want a Cricket Library weekly or a Cricket Library sticker for your yes. bat, get in, hey, the mailbags are available. Send yeah. us the question and we'll send you out a sticker. Yeah, definitely. I've actually run out of stickers. They've been so popular. Oh. There's, they're on. I think there's even, um, there's even someone playing in the UK with a Cricket Library sticker on their bat. So they are very popular, those stickers. That's good too. We've got magnets in stock as well. So 101 R Bungle Gumby Road, Borough Bedeen, New South Wales 2830, if you'd like to get your hands on one of those. We'll, we'll send one to you once they're back in, Beautiful. back in stock. But, Robbie, the big bash, the Sixers, 32 competition points, sitting pretty, you might say. Their run home, but- Thunder. Hurricane Stars. Thunder Hurricane Stars. Yeah. That, gee, that Stars one sets up a big oh, one in that's... round 14. Not so much the Sixers. Well, look, you can lock Sixers away, putting that ladder, but yeah. Melbourne Stars, after that upset loss in the derby to the Renegades, um, they are now under a lot of pressure. Yeah. So, well, that game that game last night at the 10 over mark uh, got the kids to bed, uh Sat down doing a little bit of bit of cricket library work, a bit of research, and then I thought, oh, I'll just I'll just check back in with what's happening. 
And my word, yep. what a finish. What a great result for Renegades fans. And great to see them executing their skills in pressure moments. And winning is a bit of a habit, Robbie. And sometimes you, yeah. need, you just need to win those kind of tight games to get yourself on a bit of a roll. So could be some danger signs for the teams that the Renegades have to play in those last couple of games of the season. But let's have a look at this log jam of a ladder, Robbie. We've got the, mm. the Scorchers. They're on 24. I really like the Scorchers. I really do like the look of the Scorchers on paper. A very well-balanced side. Interesting enough with the Scorchers, Matt. Now, keep this in the back of your mind. They have the equal lowest uh, boost point yes. as anyone else. They are on four boost points from the season. Renegades are in the bottom ladder on four. Sixers, who are one place in the ladder ahead of them, have had eight boost points. That's incredible. So this, yeah, keep that in mind, Matt, because this could really play a big part. I think this could have been predicted on an earlier episode of the Cricket Library Weekly. It was actually predicted. I won't say mm. who predicted it, but there were some mm. very astute judges predicting the bash boost point might have a bit of an impact. Now, the Melbourne Stars, they've played one more game. They've only got two games to go. They're also on 24 competition points. They play the highly fancied Scorchers on the road in and the Sixers. That's the toughest draw. I think I think the Stars have got the wow. toughest draw coming home. Sorry, I should have said too, the Scorchers, they play Hurricanes, Stars and Heat. I, mm. I see the Scorchers potentially winning two of those three games. Well, Matt, let, let, let's be realistic about this. You do not get, don't expect an easy game. There's none you can lock away there. Because yeah. the Renegades beat the Stars last night without a contribution from Aaron Finch and Sean Marsh. Yeah. So they they might just they might they've got two games to go. They might try to cause a bit of chaos amongst that ladder. And also if things pan out their way, they could get off the bottom of the ladder. Now that'd be nice, wouldn't it? Oh, they'd they'd be loving that. Oh, and I'd be loving that too as a Thunder fan because the strikers who are ahead of the Renegades play the Thunder yeah. twice. So for that to happen, it means the Thunder are doing pretty well. Uh, speaking of the Thunder, they've got the Sixers mm. and then the Strikers twice. Now the Strikers, I was, I was just quietly celebrating the fact that when the Thunder play the Strikers, they won't have to face the magic of Rashid Khan, the premier T20 bowler in the world. Um, but alas, there's a f- couple mm. of good ins for the Strikers. Namely, one yeah, of my Tra- favourite players, Michael Neeser. Yeah, and Travis Head. I know. So, <laughs> um, oh, well, so did you say Sydney Thunder played them twice? Yeah, they played them twice. So, right, And both in Adelaide? I'm imagining so, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think if Thunder could win one of those, Matt, if they could win one of those with a boost point, yeah, they would then go seven points clear of strikers. And strikers would have to win their last two games. Look, I know, Matt, it's probably if people haven't worked it out yet. We're both Thunder supporters. <laughs> um, Thunder could still make it with one win, but with two wins, I think they might even find themselves up into that top two. Well, I think everyone has aspirations for that top two, just that second bite of the cherry. Um, you have fin- to, Matt. Finishing you have in that to. top two. Um, now, Hurricanes, they, they've got Scorchers, Sixers, and then Renegades. They're, mm. they're also on 23 competition points, equal with the Thunder. Uh, Thunder with a, a better net run rate. Then we've got the Heat on 21 points. They play the Strikers. That one tonight for those listening on Thursday. And then we've got the Renegades and the Scorchers to round out their campaign. Then the Strikers, yeah. strikers on 20 points. They play the Heat, Thunder, Thunder. And then the Renegades, of course, trying to get themselves off the bottom of the table. They've just got two games remaining, one against the Heat and one against the Hurricanes. So, um, Who misses, that? Well, who misses? That's a very I good... I know you hate these questions. I know. <laughs> so... And I know I'm cruel doing it, but I want you... Look, we know Renegades miss. Who are the other two? Well, I think... I think just looking at the games remaining... Oh, no. The team... <laughs> The stars for mine have the the hardest draw. They have the hardest draw. I'm not saying they're, they're missing yet. They're in third yet. place, Matt. I know they're, they're in third wrong. place, but they've played one more game. Oh, okay, yeah, yep. Yeah. So right. they play the Scorchers, then the Sixers. Unless they, like, let's say they, yeah. let's say they get bash boost point in both of those games, that'd take them to 26, which yeah. takes them one one win clear of Hurricanes and Thunder. 
I can see – it's very hard here because I'm, I'm very pro Thunder and I can see the Thunder getting on a bit of a roll. Mind you, Daniel Sam's Matt, injured at the moment. Just forget about Daniel Sam's and Thunder here for a minute. You're <laughs> saying the milk. You're saying Melbourne Stars are going to miss out. No, no, I'm saying I'm saying the Melbourne Stars have the toughest draw. So I'm saying oh. that that for them to make it would almost. Do put... you feel? Are you in a position where you think you can answer the question of which t- other two teams <laughs> you think will miss out, or are you are you just at pains to say this? Uh, I'm at pains to say it, but I I've got a feeling that the Brisbane Heat might miss out. Right, oh, uh, Lynn Sanity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and they haven't got a great um, net run rate. Well, the reason I say the Heat is because they are so unpredictable. Yeah, right. Some, yep. Sometimes, it, like if if they don't bring their A game against the Renegades, they could get pantsed. And yeah, I tend to agree. Yeah, okay. Whereas, yep. whereas I feel like the Strikers are the kind of team, they're going to get some points out of their final three games. Well, will they make the top five, Matt? Yeah, I, I see the strikers sneaking into the top okay. five. So I've. So, you're, are you suggesting it might be the hurricane to you tipped early in the year to miss out that will miss out? No, I think I, I, I think I had the hurricanes in the top five at the start of the year. Did you? I yeah. think you had eight teams in the top five, Matt. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm going to have to go back and have a look at the archives. Yeah, but we'll I, go over the <laughs> over the tape, as they say. I, the I, I think I've got um, I've got some good editors here who can come come back yeah. and um, release my top five. But I I've got the heat as a as a miss. I I think the strikers okay. may beat them tonight. In fact, and I, I just so and that one could be the stars. You'll know. I know you're going to know more after the next couple of nights, yeah. games, yeah. because everyone would have been on twelve by then. It's probably a bit of an unfair question, but no, no, it's a fair I, question, I, very fair question. Yeah, I, I think the stars miss out too, and I, I think the Heat miss out and the Renegades miss out. So Fraser Middleton, our man in Edinburgh, yeah, um, happy, happy days. That hey, ben, if McDermott keeps batting like he did, they could go on and win the whole damn thing. And Tim Payne's going to come back apparently. Yeah, well, I hope he does. yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing him in in the Hurricanes uniform. Gee, the way Ben McDermott batted there the other night against oh. against the Thunder was absolutely incredible. He is one of the cleanest strikers of the ball going yep. around, and it's it's players why like us, that. Though? Why up? Yeah, why, why us? Yeah. <laughs> well, same. We have a look. the 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 two leading run scorers in in the Big Bash have a day out against the Thunder and cause people to start yep. to panic a little bit about the thunder but um the, there we go robbie i'm right. I, i'm as on the fence as i ever will be i uh, can't see myself getting off the fence unfortunately yep all right um yeah the only the only two safe comments you'll get from me is that i think the sixes will qualify and the renegades will miss out <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you've and tailed it That's uh, okay, <laughs> right. hey maybe a, a quick couple of stats out of uh, Josh Phillippe, currently the leading um, run scorer. Yeah. With 421. Yeah. Benny McDermott, the man you mentioned, 397, and Stoinis on a 370. Alex Hale, to mine, I think he's been the player, the batter of the tournament so far with 352 runs, but a strike rate of 157 with 18 sixes. So, for yeah. mine, I reckon Alex Hale has been, yeah, the number one batter. What about in the bowling department, Matty? Who? Who's been your bowler of the of the tournament? Well, no, no one would have any shock that I love J. A. Richardson from the Scorchers. I yeah, J. Yeah. Richardson. I, I think um, I was I was talking to my nine year old about this. Um, he loves J. Richardson as well. Um, yep. Just feel like he is at his electric best and ready to be putting on the Australian jersey again in one of the formats soon. Yeah. Uh, 21 wickets at the tournament, three clear of the next uh, next bowler, who's another one of my favourites in Tanvir Sanger. Mark Steckerty and Adam Zampa as well on 18 wickets. Uh, then Wes Agar, Rashid Khan uh, coming in after that. Just looking at the um, bowling economy, uh, Jai Richardson is second on the bowling economy as well, 6.29. Okay. 6. Majib 
Mujib, uh, top of that list at 6.27. Nathan Coulter Nile, what a ball that was to knock over uh, oh. SE Marsh there last night. That oh. was an absolute peach of a delivery. Liking the way Coulter Nile goes about his business, he's got the third best uh, economy rate at the moment. And Adam Zamper on that list as well. Quality spinners win matches. Stephen O'Keefe on that one yep. as well. Um, and just sorry, just back on on the batting, uh, mm-hmm. the Usman Kawaja Alex Hales partnership feature three times on the on the top opening batting list, and the other one that's up there is, is Jason, that right? yeah, Jason Roy and Liam Livingston from the Scorchers up there as well as Aaron Finch and Sean Marsh. Interestingly, as well, they've got two of the top top ten partnerships as well. So, uh, I I think. Usman and Alex uh, are really good at getting the player that's in on strike, if that makes sense. So if Usman's yeah, hitting them yeah. well, Alex Hales is really good at letting Usman take the lion's share of deliveries in that, that that first four overs. Whereas if Hales is going, you'll find that Hales is facing the majority of the deliveries and cashing yep. in. And that's something that I, I think uh, Jason Roy and Liam Livingston, uh, my kids love watching Liam Livingston bat. They, he's a... He's, Seems to be a lot of love for the Scorchers in my house. I might need to do some – I might need to go to some parenting classes. But uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, just just back on the batting as well, um, the strike rates, Daniel Christian and Daniel Sams, both striking at over 190 um, with the with the bat. Yeah. So yep. that that's pretty crucial, that role sort of coming in in that lower middle order and, and facing balls when the power surge is on as well. So, plenty to look forward to, Robbie. I can't wait. I, I, I'm already preparing myself for the end of Big Bash. I, I kind of go on a bit of a, a low when, when the Big yeah, Bash finishes. I've noticed that. It's, it's a yep. real highlight uh, of my year. Um, yeah. and, then, and then it's like the kids go back to school and then the Big mm. Bash finishes and then it's like uh, the, par- well, the party's over, so to speak. If it helps. There's a nice little test series um, that's been covered, I think, on Fox. Is uh, India v England that will oh. commence in February and March. So that's that will nice little time fill up for you in the evenings if you like, Matt. Oh, I'll have something to write in my notebook. Thank goodness for that, Robbie. <laughs> there you go. There's always cricket, isn't there? Yeah, there is. There is. But guess what, Robbie? Um, we're out of time, and no. Yeah. Um, really sorry too. No time for our uh, traditional haiku poem. This week, um, wow! But rest assured, I gee, I hope Matt Fiction. I I can hear my phone just about to ring uh, right now from Matt Fiction asking why he's been cut. What's it's, he up to? Oh, he he's preparing for that England Sri Lanka series. Oh no, no. Uh, he, well, he's been uh, been been watching that England Sri Lanka uh, series and not sure. Uh, after that, where he's off to. But, um, yeah, Matt Fiction will be back next time with another haiku poem. But we're out of right. time for this week. Don't forget, if you've got questions for Matt's mailbag, you can get them in 101R Bungle Gumby Road, Borough Bedeen, 2830. And we'll be answering those questions again next week. Massive thanks to you, Robbie McKinlay. Massive thanks to Piper Cleary for joining us. And, of course, a... Massive thanks to you, our loyal listeners who tune in each and every week to the Cricket Library Weekly. My name's Matt Ellis, and it's been a pleasure joining you alongside Robbie McKinlay. Bye for now.